Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here together uh, for the closing conference of the EI Plus project. Um, and we worked for the past years uh, in the in looking at the implementation of inclusive education in five different countries. Um, I am Elisabeth de Schouwer. I work at Ghent University in the Department of Special Needs Education. And I'm very focused on inclusive education in our Flemish community. We work together in this, in this project um, to look at the implementation processes in the five countries at the beginning of this project. Afterwards, we developed training packages together in close co-production with uh, the five countries. And today we are going to talk about those training packages and how we roll them out in the different countries and how the participants also responded to those packages. So we have the honor here to be together with people from um, Belgium, Gert and Quentin, and people from Greece, uh, Mike and Maria, who will uh, talk with us about uh, what they did in their countries and how the participants responded to it. First of all, maybe a little introduction about our partners who are here around the digital table. Um, on the first hand, we on on my left hand, I would say, but it's, you cannot see it. So it's uh, when we start with the people from Greece, we have Mike Karagioris and um, Maria Zaberzi uh, from Et Estia. And Estia is a charity organization recognized by the Ministry of Health, Health and Social Solidarity in Greece. It was founded in 1982 by parents of children with intellectual disabilities. And today it specializes in providing support and care to persons with an intellectual disability from the age of 15, with the aim of improving the quality of life and supporting inclusion in the community. On the other hand, we have the partners from UNIA, from Belgium. And UNIA is an independent public institution that fights discrimination and promotes equal opportunities. UNIA encourages Belgian citizens and particular, in particular uh, government author authorities, public institutions and companies to combat the discrimination and segregation. They also provide support to citizens who have experienced discrimination in ve on various grounds, race, faith, disability, age, sexual orientation. And they um, went along with this project to have the um, training sessions in the Belgian, in the Flemish community. So we have our two partners around the table and we would like to discuss with four questions the training packages that we delivered and the contact with the participants on that and um, maybe after each each session we can look at the chat and see if there are questions from people in our audience so first of all, um, it would be good to have a look at your training ses sessions and how you conduct your training sessions. Can you tell us something more about that? Um, can we start with uh, Maria and uh, Michael? Okay. Good morning from Greece. Hello. It's nice to be all together, although we think that it would be much better if we could have a physical contact in Belgium. But unfortunately, we are separate, but you are all in our heart. <laughs> Thank you for having us now this nice uh, last uh, webinar from, for that uh, successful uh, project that we almost uh, done. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about how we conduct uh, the two trainings that uh, were offered in our participants. Uh, we first did a pilot uh, training, which uh, took place uh, last year. 
And in that uh, training, it was uh, the beginning of our journey uh, because uh, we would like to have uh, an open question regarding uh, what was uh, the meaning of uh, inclusive education and uh, how our participants uh, um, view and had an idea of what the inclusive education was. Uh, could, uh, they could understand it. The meaning of inclusive, meaning of inclusive uh, education. Okay. So what we tried to do was that we tried to localize the content according to the Greek laws, to the Greek policies and the environment. So all the participants uh, would like, first of all, to be sure that we all talk the same language. That was very important for us because if we want to speak and to talk about inclusive education, we really want to to make sure that we all know what the inclusive education is and what yeah. the goals of our inclusive education was. So the first thing for us was to have a nice and open discussion yeah. regarding the, um, the inclusive education. It was much more a discussion than a training. In the first pilot, the first uh, pilot session. Training. After that, we, uh, we tried to see what the main issues were and how can I, how can change them and what changes can we make? For example, it was a very big difference in definition because uh, what we realized was most of our participants thought that integration was inclusive education yeah. rather than inclusive. So there was a difference in the, in the terminology. So we tried to be very specific and to try to be more focus on the terminology because it's a very big issue. With examples and role-playing, what the difference we... between uh, integration and, uh, and uh, inclusion. Uh, and in our effort to reach our, uh, our trainees, uh, we sent uh, emails, uh, phone calls, um, we upload through our website, our Facebook, we try to invite and to um, reach our participants. In the second um, seminar, which was uh, the main uh, seminar, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, have uh, uh, in real time uh, participants, so it has to be uh, a webinar. Uh, which uh, was positive for us because uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, participants and we think that was one of the achievements because due to the COVID, the number of participants was much higher rather than the first uh, seminar. Uh, and um, again, our goal was to have an open discussion rather than a structured teaching and instruction uh, training. training, which was which will be quite uh, boring for all of us. Yeah. Of course, the lack of uh, physical uh, contact in the second uh, part of uh, of, uh, uh, of our training, uh, it was a problem because of the COVID. Um, but uh, the, the positive thing, uh, uh, as Maria said, uh, was that uh, we could uh, have uh, much more participants uh, than the first uh, the training. And what were the main themes that you addressed in the second uh, meeting? The, the main thing that we addressed was uh, actually the easy to read content. Uh, because we tried to, to have our service user, people with intellectual disabilities, uh, who tested all the content of the project. So what uh, we did was um, yeah. we translate uh, all the content in easy to read version, and then we had our service users, uh, we sit down together, and yeah. uh, we went uh, step by step to check uh, uh, the content and we listened to them and uh, we co-produce all the content in an uh, easy to read uh, language. And we think that it was, that was one of the main achievements of the yeah. second okay. uh, mm -hmm. uh, webinar because uh, our service users, people with intellectual disabilities were more much involved. And um, actually it's a good idea because the, the most of the participants didn't were very aware of easy to read the version. So it was a good idea to explain and to see more uh, things and uh, speak about what the easy to read uh, version is and how important and inclusive uh, uh, education yeah. is. 
and how the easy to read can be a tool, a very useful tool in uh, inclusive education. Okay, yes, thank you very much, Maria and Michael to, and Mike to talk a little bit about what happened in Greece. Can we also listen to the people from Belgium and have input on what they did in our Belgian context? Uh, well, thank you for having us as well here. We're very, very happy to be able to speak here at the end of this very difficult project with the COVID-19 situation. Um, I think the, the general lines of what we did are more or less the same in the sense that in the first pilot sessions in 2019, we also localized the content to the, the Belgian or more specifically to the Flemish situation, the Flemish laws and regulations. Um, but the main thing that came out from the evaluation of those pilot sessions was that the the way we organized the first pilot sessions was we did it in different chapters following the six chapters of the project so we had inclusion as a human right uh, universal design for learning monitoring the quality of inclusive education financing of inclusive education inclusion in the school context and inclusion in the class context and so we had one half day for each of those topics and the main thing that came out of the evaluation was that this separation between these topics was way too artificial. Uh, there are so many links to be made between all those different topics that we decided to overhaul the whole idea of, uh, of these training sessions. Um, and so for the second series of training sessions, we, we, which we had planned to organize in April, um, we organized those sessions around three organization levels uh, let me explain myself so we had the idea to organize one training session for the micro level which is the school uh, the class level so targeting uh, teachers more specifically and everything that happens within the classroom uh, in the second session the idea was to have a well, I mean, the second organization level we targeted was the meso level, the school level. Uh, and the third level is the macro level, the um, um, educational policy level. So the idea was to focus more uh, on those three level and which would have allowed us to target uh, different target groups for all of those levels. So having people who work within classrooms in one session, having people who work in the Flemish parliament, for example, in another session. Um, within that framework, we also had the first two chapters, so inclusion as a human right and universal design for learning or the basics of that, to have those in a plenary session for everyone as a common base and from there on uh, go more in depth uh, depending on the specific level. Um, I think the COVID-19 of course forced us to postpone the whole ID. Uh, two times actually and in the end we not only had to postpone but also uh, do it the whole thing online which forced us again to rethink the whole uh, training session. Uh, I think COVID-19 was definitely the biggest challenge we had during this whole uh, during this project but as um, Maria explained this also allowed us to to reach uh, a lot more people to target, to, to have a, a broader reach, I think. Uh, well, I'll let Gert discuss more on what uh, our yeah. is now, but we've had around 400 people uh, watching at the different videos we produced. So we're very happy with that, but Gert. Yes, COVID-19 forced us to organize everything online. And what we did is we asked every participant to view three interviews that we've put online. Uh, one interview with you, Elizabeth, on um, the socio-ecological approach to uh, disability. What can a teacher do? What can a school do in, in their approach to disability? How can they depend on their own strengths, what they have as ex expertise? A uh, professor in uh, educational right who explained what the right to inclusive education means and uh, what um, this demands from governments and schools. And then a third short interview with a child uh, with an intellectual disability about his uh, trajectory in, in school. Uh, and as Quentin uh, said, we had uh, more uh, than 400 uh, people, individual people that viewed these interviews. So we had a, a very broad um, 
uh, we, we reached out to a lot of people. And then on the three separate uh, training mornings, uh, what we called them, we let participants choose between um, each time two different inspirational tables, inspiratie tafels in Dutch. I'm still proud of the term we chose, uh, which touched on different aspects of the micro, meso and macro level that uh, Quentin uh, explained. And then after a short break, we had the participants of the two different inspiration tables uh, come together to discuss uh, each a different situation, educational situation, and uh, apply the insights that they had just been uh, given in the inspirational um, uh, inspiration tables. And we, we had a lot of uh, positive feedback that th this was a good way of working to immediately um, um, set about in using what you just learned. So my uh, a lot of action during the training sessions, as well in Greece as in Belgium. We reached a lot of people. A lot of people were also interested in the teams that we provided from this project. Um, what, it, what is interesting me is that um, inclusive education is a question of collaboration. It is a we story. It is not something that one party can do on its own or can decide tomorrow, okay, now we are going for inclusive education. You are always entangled and dependent on other parties. Um, I think that was also something important in this project that we uh, realized that it was depending on a lot of stakeholders. Can you give us some more insights about how you did work together with stakeholders and who were your stakeholders in this project? Can we again first go to Greece and then come back to Belgium? Okay, Maria and Mike. Yeah, thank you. Bob. I think that the main uh, issue you just mentioned that Elizabeth is that uh, how we can uh, work together because uh, we, all, we all are part in uh, the process of inclusive education. And we must be a part. So that was our, that was, uh, our main goal uh, because uh, we wanted to bring together people okay. from general education and people from uh, special education we what we tried and we wanted to, to we would like would like to to take those people and sit down together to discuss together to exchange uh, knowledge and uh, know-how and experiences yes. in uh, their teaching methods and uh, in the beliefs and uh, in the how they can structure a lesson and uh, what we tried to do was to bring together all the knowledge because uh, the knowledge is something that we have to focus and uh, to learn from uh, each other and to go step forward. For that reason, what we did was uh, we sent the index of inclusion to our participants the day, to the, the day before the second uh -huh. seminar. So we just gave them uh, uh, the time Yes. To look the index and to have an idea okay. about the index of inclusive okay. education. Yeah. And then in our day of uh, training, we discuss it and uh, we, we exchange ideas and uh, how we can apply and what the obstacles of the index of inclusion uh, were. So we try to have uh, open questions and uh, we try to to have some po we, we mentioned some points and some um, major uh, uh, decisions and uh, suggestions that uh, they had and uh, also we involve our service users in the second uh, seminar uh, as observers so what they had some time to listen to other people and in the end of the training uh, they Present the presenting the easy to read uh, version. We also had some uh, role playing between uh, the participants. What was yeah. uh, during the first and the second? It's a good idea uh, if someone can be 
in the position of the other. So we'd like to show how the real situation can be. Uh, so do we think that the real, the role playing was a good example? Yeah, of course. Uh, we wanted them to to think how they could uh, act if they have uh, if they had. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, uh, difficulties. Difficulties. Uh, difficulties in learning difficulties or uh, difficulties to move uh, or see or hear. Uh, Uh, Mike, we cannot hear you. Can you come a little bit yeah. closer? Yeah, okay. Uh, we think that the role playing, uh, especially during the first uh, training, uh, that uh, it was a very good part of the training because uh, the, uh, everyone uh, could uh, uh, understand um, uh, which, which, is, which are the difficulties of a uh, person with, uh, to, to, with disabilities to move and uh, understand uh, things uh, in the school environment. Yeah. Yeah. Belgium? Yes. Okay, Belgium. Belgium. Um, well, we started from the experience we had, of course, and that experience, uh, we've had years of experience in assisting parents in asserting the rights of their children to inclusive education. Uh, and during the, the years, we have learned a lot from those daily struggles and from all of that. But it was a very uh, legal focus on inclusive education and on the rights to reasonable accommodation. Whereas during this project, from the start, we'd had the opportunity or even the duty to prepare and deliver the whole pilot sessions with a, a very broad array of stakeholders. So we've worked with uh, pupils with uh, intellectual disabilities and their parents, with teachers, with the support persons of those pupils, uh, ergotherapists, academics from different fields, uh, pedagogic, peda pedagogical, uh, I don't know if it's a word in English, pedagogical pedagogical services from uh, the different education providers. So it was very interesting to have all of those different stakeholders uh, have a look at the different texts that we had produced, uh, the, the theoretical base of the project. We've had all those stakeholders take a look at those texts. Then they told us what was, according to them, what was lacking, uh, which were the most important aspects, uh, where we needed to tweak certain aspects to fit the Flemish re education reality a little bit more. Uh, so we've had a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion with all those actors to make sure that our view of inclusive education was more holistic or more realistic as well. So that was a very interesting phase of the project, the whole preparation of it. Um, so then afterwards to prepare the different chapters, uh, the different uh, pilot sessions, we identified key actors with, who could help us deliver those specific aspects of the trainings. Um, so that was very interesting. However, we did choose for the second uh, pilot, for the second, not the pilot, for the second uh, training sessions, what we did was, um, well, we chose to trust the different actors more in their expertise, because in the first phase, in the pilot sessions, we started off from the text and tried to find actors who could deliver those parts. Whereas in the second sessions, we focused more on, okay, which expertise do the different actors have? And then we, um, we tried to insert the, the project topics in their expertise rather than try to fit their expertise in the project topic. So we worked the other way around, uh, which I believe uh, made sure that the different training sessions were more coherent, were a better story as the different stakeholders who brought the different aspects of the training, they really brought their own thing, which made it a, a stronger, uh, more, more complete uh, training sessions. So for the second uh, training sessions, which took place this year, we were very lucky to be able to count on Wout, who's a, a nice young man with an intellectual disability. Uh, we've filmed his testimony on how he, uh, experienced inclusive education, uh, all facets of it, uh, as well the learning aspects as the social aspects of inclusive education, the difficulties, the thing that made it interesting or uh, the different things that teachers did to help him uh, have a, well, not an easy trajectory, but a, a challenging trajectory, uh, which fits his specific needs. 
Uh, after that, we've also had uh, a professor of education law, Professor uh, Kurt Willems. He gave a crystal clear explanation of human rights, uh, of the human right to inclusive education, like what can uh, be expected from government, what can be expected from school. We, we, sh we often mingle those different aspects in the debate, but it's very important to tell a school actor like, this is your responsibility. Those other responsibilities are the government's responsibilities, and that's not something you should worry about. Try to do what you can within your scope of responsibility. And we've discovered that that message really resonated with a lot of actors as they realized, okay, I could choose to complain about uh, the context, which isn't good, or I could choose to focus on my job and do the best I can within the given context. Uh, so we focused on that and a lot of actors discovered that by sharing um, small, really small little aspects of inclusive practices, uh, sharing tips and tricks on how to do certain things of inclusive education, that apparently was a need for a lot of actors. Um, I'm going too fast here. We've also had a third video with uh, you, uh, Professor Elisabeth Schauer, uh, where you explained how disability can be approached at school, how teachers can rely on their own experience, because you always start from what the teachers can do. Uh, if you have to see what they can't do, well, then they need training, but start from what they can do, from what they have uh, within their, their uh, capabilities and competencies and start from there. Because when you start from there, there's a lot of things they actually can do to develop a more inclusive education environment. They won't immediately uh, develop a class which is perfect universal design for learning, but they can make small steps in the good direction, which is very, very important. And so after the videos, uh, we've also had the different inspiration tables, and they also were brought by a wide array of, uh, of stakeholders. We've had academics from different fields again. We've had a parent of a child with uh, specific uh, learning needs. Um, we've had a school principal come to, sh to share his story on how they have... Um, over a course of 15 years really trans transformed their school from uh, a traditional school to a very inclusive type of school. Uh, we've had the school inspection services explain how they control the way they look at uh, inclusion and the way they control whether a school is inclusive or not. Uh, we've had government employees explain uh, how they view certain aspects of inclusion. So it was very interesting to have all those different uh, stakeholders explain how they look at inclusive education and, and to really uh, crystallize what is whose responsibility um, so we really learn between the pilot session and the final session, we really learn to trust all the different actors in their own expertise and to give them more freedom uh, to start from their expertise and to link that to the different chapters, uh, which allowed us to focus on small steps that teachers or principals or support person can actually make within their own uh, field of responsibility to make sure that they can um, implement what they have learned during our training sessions they can implement it well i think right now they're doing it uh, just right after the training sessions they told us well this is good i can start with this next week or the week after that i don't have to wait for my principal to overhaul the whole school uh, system so that appeared to be a very a very strong thing within the the framework and it's thanks to the whole to all the stakeholders we worked with that we we saw this as a as an interesting practice. Gert, do you want to add something? Or is it OK? No, I just um, posted the three links to the videos on YouTube. So for the people who will, after this session, would like to see the videos, they can on YouTube. OK, um, let me just have a look at the chat to see if uh, there are questions for, our, for us at the moment. Um, if people have things they want to um, know more about or that are not clear for them at the moment on what was happening during the trainings, please come in and ask us. Uh, you can put on your microphone and just tell your questions or your ideas to us, or you can put it in the chat also if that feels um, less threshold for you. 
So um, I think we have now had a look at what was possible in Greece to do, what was possible in Belgium to do, and how in the two years time that we have the pilot trainings and then the training sessions this year, how we uh, adjusted ourselves to COVID-19 and how it was very much in the middle of our project. So um, we, we conducted the trainings and we uh, introduced a lot of stakeholders in this project. But what do you think the trainings did to the stakeholders? Can we tell something more about how they responded to the sessions? Can we tell something more about what came up in the discussions and what were topics that people discussed about. Um, so it would be good also to see some of the responses of your participants and the impact you think your, the training could have had. Okay, Maria and Mike from Greece, can you start? Yes, of course. Um, I think that uh, the the main uh, problem um, that our, uh, that uh, our participant uh, uh, mentioned uh, it was that uh, uh, they all agreed that uh, inclusion uh, uh, it's very positive in theory, uh, but. Um, uh, they they said that uh, there are a lot of practical problems um, that uh, will. Uh, yeah, yeah, we. Uh, the main issues that um, they had they had were that even they were very positive in theory and they all knew about the most of them knew about the inclusive education. They mentioned about the practical issues and the practical problems that they have to face in everyday teaching. For example, some of the teachers mentioned that in a class, in an ordinary class with 27 students, uh, including uh, people with uh, students with disabilities, uh, it's, it would be very, very difficult to focus and to, uh, to work with the individual and to try to be inclusive as uh, they wanted to be. Uh, so they focus some uh, obstacles regarding uh, the number of uh, the students, which is uh, something that we all have to think about because in Greece, in most of the classes, the average uh, number of students is 25, 24 students, something that is very difficult for a teacher. Uh, another obstacle uh, that uh, they mentioned was that uh, the, even if they knew, they didn't have enough um, seminars and uh, further education provided by the school or by the local authorities in order for the young, especially the, the younger uh, teachers to have uh, more um, education in inclu about inclusive education. So, so then they wanted it's more better. and further education in inclusive education. Another obstacle that they mentioned, especially from uh, our parents partic participant, was the cooperation between uh, family uh, and uh, the school. There, uh, even uh, so, something that they, that was a very big uh, discussion because uh, some of the uh, families they are still believe that uh, the most suitable place for them could be special education rather than uh, special school, rather than uh, ordinary schools, because they feel more confident and they feel that they are more supportive in a very secure environment for their children. Um, unfortunately, in, in our days uh, in Greece, even if uh, we have uh, uh, mainstream schools uh, and some of them, they, they are some students with uh, disabilities, um, according to the to the bibliography, you can still see that the family uh, prefer to send their children in uh, special uh, uh, schools. Uh, there were, but uh, but um, the, the positive uh, thing uh, is that uh, everyone, uh, including us, uh, understand understood that. Um, uh, we can 
we can't uh, reach uh, inclusive education uh, from uh, one day to another. Um, we can't be 100% uh, inclusive, inclusive in uh, one day or one week. It's a procedure uh, that is uh, very long uh, in, in, and it takes uh, time to, uh, to achieve. Uh, but uh, everyone uh, can make um, small steps or small things or, or uh, small uh, changes uh, uh, to the school environment or to the class environment and uh, can be more inclusive uh, than now. Um, I think one of the major statements that uh, most of the participants uh, agreed uh, was that, uh, especially for the teachers from the general education, was that uh, they, it was about the second chapter, how you can uh, think before you act. In other words, uh, how can a teacher can think first, the person who's going to teach, plan, uh, how yes. to plan uh, your, your yes. lesson and how you can organize your material in order to start uh, teaching uh, your your students, uh, if uh, even if they have or not a disability, that doesn't matter. But uh, what uh, is the main uh, steps uh, that a teacher can do in everyday class? Yes, UDL was uh, something that uh, uh, they they were very interesting in to to understand UDL and. Uh, um the, the the meaning of it and they uh, believe that uh, it is a very nice tool uh, uh and they can use it in their uh, uh everyday lessons in the classroom yeah, we think that uh, after the the two seminars most all the participants mentioned that uh, they start having a second thought yeah. uh that was uh our belief sure. and, yeah. and they said that oops yes we have it's to a yeah a yeah you have to start thinking uh, from a different uh, side of education and that was our most uh, important uh, achievement for mm -hmm. us thank you Maria and Mike, you did a lot of work in your Greek context. Um, yeah. And I think I recognize the inspiration also that Quentin and Gert were talking about. We try to give educational professionals a lot of inspiration on what yeah. is possible and what they can do in yeah. a context that is not far from perfect, in uh, resources that are not enough, in legislations that are not clear enough and not have a clear in inclusive vision. But we try to do something with what we have at the moment. Yeah. And yeah. hands on, you have a lot of information of what the teachers did with that. And that's mm -hmm. very nice to hear. Thank you very much for your uh, for what you brought in and for your input this morning also. Quentin and Gert, can we listen also also to you and talk a little bit about what you think the participants did with what you uh, mm -hmm. were trying to do during the workshops. Yeah, what we saw, uh, Elizabeth, is that uh, the participants had a great and shared need for more for a more inclusive approach. Uh, like Maria just explained, they want to go ahead with this uh, uh, universal design for learning. They want to do things that are more inclusive. Um, and this on different levels, uh, from the classroom floor at the micro level, Quentin explained over school directions, the meso level, to up to the political level even. And you could sense this hunger, really a hunger to set about, to have a clear goal, to work together and to exchange experiences. Very important, what we saw is people in the chat also, they exchanged experiences um, because the inspirational tables that we had were really interactive and people could share a lot of their experiences. So it was really, we really saw this, this hunger to cooperate and to learn from each other. And um, through the trainings, we, we also always, as Quentin earlier said, we, we emphasize the importance of what can you do within your own context and don't discuss uh, now what the obstacles are you can mention them but look at your own context what can you do and how can you set about and um, in the end even the critical voices that we had in the in the three uh, training days 
they uh, admitted that the training was to them very inspirational and that it helped them to overcome the app obstacles that they they pointed out during the training sessions so in the end i guess that we yes we were able to to bring about some change in the in the participants mindset i can just so what struck me as well, it was very interesting to see that at certain point we've had critical voices sharing obstacles and difficulties. It was quite interesting to see that the other participants actually told this person, well, stop focusing on the obstacles and the difficulties you cannot change anything about. Stop complaining about educational policy, which doesn't make it easier for you. Try to find things you can do within your own context. So that was very interesting to see, to have the other participants bringing back the, the, the people being too pessimistic in a certain sense. What, pessimistic is not the right word in the sense that they are right. There is something to criticize about the policy. But it was very interesting to see. Okay, uh, I just want to have a look at the chat because there was a question uh, from Marco who said, um, I understand that the vision of a student with an, intellectual dis uh, with an intellectual disability was used within the sessions in Belgium. Were there also other pupils, uh, pupils with a physical disability, pupils with a developmental disorder, pupils with a regular development, were they also included in this program? Our focus uh, was on intellectual disability mainly and also uh, behavioral uh, problems. Um, we had, for instance, a school director of a school in the region of Leuven where they stopped uh, punishing uh, pupils, but they um, installed an approach where and on the onset, right from the onset, when a, a student or a pupil is starting to show problematic behavior in the classroom, they pick him or her out of the classroom and they have a um, teacher who has a special function to, with, an, with a psychological therapeutical background or formation to talk with this pupil to, to, to help this pupil to focus uh, on his or her approach in the classroom and to overcome personal problems and to, to help start to find a solution for the personal problem so that the, it doesn't hinder the interaction with the other pupils and that he or she can learn in the classroom. So, but yes, the focus was on, um, on intellectual disability and on behavioral problems, but Quentin will yeah, this was a choice we had made because these, those two topics appear to be the topics with which most teachers struggled the most. Um, during the preparation, we've had several discussions uh, or several examples of inclusive practices focused more on... Um, or, or or is, I was going to say something else. We've had several examples of teachers removing optical obstacles for uh, pupils with physical disability, but th those were every time considered, well, that's easy with, to yeah. deal with a physical disability. The most difficult thing is to deal with developmental disorders or with uh, learning disabilities. So that's why we chose in the second uh, training sessions to, to focus more on, the, on those other aspects. Okay. Thank you very much for coming back to your training sessions with us. I think what was very important or what struck me very much in what you shared with us is that we have to look to inclusion as a process, mm -hmm. as something that goes up and down at certain moments. And it's not something that we can say, okay, we are there. Mm -hmm. All schools will be inclusive. No, it's a process that lays ahead of us and a challenge that we take with our both hands and that we work on on a daily basis. Everyone who is involved in inclusive education needs to take his or her responsibility in this process. And then together we can have better qualitative regular education for all our students. And that is also something that was that struck me in how you shared how the participants responded also, but what uh, kinds of practices, inspirational practices are still 
they still need that input. People are still searching for a lot of input. It's not that they don't want, but it's something about how can we do it? And that question was really on the table during our training sessions. In the meanwhile, I see that it's 12 o'clock. I don't know if there is something that you really want to share from Greece or from Belgium. And otherwise, I think we need to go back to our um, main session. But I see there is still something that you want to share. Please, Maria. Yes, what I would like to say that was that uh, both uh, Michael and I, we believe that we became more uh, inclusive mm -hmm. trainers because we we learn how to cooperate with um, uh, trainers from other countries which is something like inclusive uh, uh, training uh, we exchange experiences um, we learn from each other and i think that is the process of inclusive education even even for us as a trainers because we learn new things uh, we exchange our idea and uh, we went uh, a step uh, forward so exclusive education is for everyone. It's not only for students. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what Kanta wants to say, but I would want to point out to uh, maybe Belgian or Flemish participants to this uh, uh, workshop that we UNIA plans to put online all the content of the inspirational tables that we organized so that uh, everybody can use this material in his or her own organization. So um, it's not online yet. We are still um, um, uh, busy with the montage of the of the videos of the inspirational tables, but it will be online shortly. So watch out uh, for uh, on our website. And on our Facebooks and Instagrams Facebook, and all of that. Yeah, okay. What I wanted to add, um, because we we tend to maybe overemphasize the own responsibility of all actors, but it's very important as well to reach out to other people, to other um, to people with different jobs, but reach out to them because you're not going to find solutions on your own. And that's something we discovered is that uh, there aren't many people within the educational sector in Flanders who are used to reaching out for help. They're not used to saying, well, I, I cannot do this on my own. I need to be assisted. I need to learn something new. So those are two things. Focus on what you can do, but to learn what you can do, reach out to others. That's a very important thing we learned as well. Mm. Reach, reach out to each other and jump. Beautiful words. Before we go to lunch and before we reach out and jump, we will go back to the main session for a little while and then I can only thank you very much for joining us and also for um, sharing this information from Greece and from Belgium with us. So thank you very much and hope to see you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.